Hi, my name is Glenn Weiner, and today we're going to look at how air pollution could potentially save our planet. We can solve the carbon dioxide problem by replacing fossil fuel with green energy. However, this alone will probably not solve the climate tipping point problem. We seem to be approaching these critical thresholds too quickly. Therefore, we probably need to reflect approximately 1% of sunlight back into outer space to cool the planet. There are several ways to do this, one of which is called stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI for short. This involves spraying reflective gases or liquids into the upper atmosphere using airplanes. The two primary layers in the atmosphere are referred to as the troposphere and the stratosphere. To make this easier to follow, we will refer to these as the lower atmosphere and the upper atmosphere. Stratospheric aerosol injection involves inserting material with reflective properties into the upper atmosphere. The altitude needed to access this layer depends on position. For example, at the equator, the upper atmosphere starts at a 20 kilometer altitude, whereas near the North and South Poles, it starts at a 12 kilometer altitude. Existing aircraft can reach the upper atmosphere over the polar regions, making it possible to cool them using currently operating airplanes. However, cooling the entire planet would require injecting material at the equator at altitudes around 20 kilometers. And unfortunately, we don't have large airplanes that can fly to that height. Therefore, to cool the entire planet with SAI, we would need to develop new aircraft, which takes time and money. For this reason, SAI would probably involve two phases. Phase one would cool the polar regions with existing airplanes to prevent tipping points associated with those regions. And phase two would cool the entire planet at a later date with newly developed aircraft. And each phase would probably be built up gradually. For example, one could operate at one ten thousandth of full-scale operations, look for harm, and advance if none was detected. One possible injection material is sulfur dioxide gas. Sulfur occurs naturally in coal and oil and is therefore emitted into the atmosphere when these fuels are burnt. In principle, it could be extracted before combustion, moved to an airplane, and admitted into the upper atmosphere instead of being emitted at ground level. Stratospheric sulfur stays aloft for one to two years, while sulfur emitted at low altitudes typically stays aloft for only hours to days. Therefore, shifting the emission site reduces the temperature of the planet while not increasing total sulfur emissions. Sulfur injected into the upper atmosphere follows a different path than sulfur injected into the lower atmosphere. Sulfur in the upper atmosphere is rare, however, it is made possible with volcanic eruptions and SAI. When sulfur dioxide gas enters the upper atmosphere, it chemically reacts with water and oxygen to form liquid H2SO4. This combines with water to produce microscopic droplets that are typically 50% H2SO4 and 50% water. These droplets last for one to two years while reflecting sunlight back into outer space. Significant quantities of sulfur are already present in the lower atmosphere, primarily due to fossil fuel combustion. However, this sulfur typically remains airborne for only hours to days because of rainfall and gravity. In humid conditions, tiny sulfuric droplets grow into cloud droplets consisting of more than 99% water. 
clouds with sulfur reflect more sunlight than clouds without and therefore offset global warming with cooling. Air temperature varies with altitude in unobvious ways as shown in this graph. This has altitude on the vertical axis and air temperature on the horizontal axis. As one can see, the atmosphere is relatively warm at ground level and gets colder as one goes up. However, this reverses after one enters the upper atmosphere since ozone in this region absorbs solar radiation and causes temperatures to become warmer as one goes higher. In other words, there is a layer of relatively cold air in the bottom of the upper atmosphere and a layer of warmer air above it. Also, warm air rises, which means material injected at the bottom of the upper atmosphere will go up and not quickly fall to Earth due to gravity. Therefore, one gram of sulfur injected into the upper atmosphere will cool the planet significantly more than one gram injected at ground level. This is why moving sulfur from the lower atmosphere to the upper atmosphere cools the planet and does not increase total sulfur emissions. In other words, SAI involves moving air pollution from one place to another. Increasing the reflectivity of the atmosphere involves three physical areas of operation. These are polar research, cooling the polar regions, and cooling the entire planet. Polar research involves a spray plane that injects material into the upper atmosphere and then monitoring that material for days to weeks. Monitoring entails flying below the material, above the material, and through the material. For details, click on the link in the description below. Cooling the polar regions involves approximately 100 Boeing 777 airplanes that inject material close to the North and South Poles to block tipping points associated with those regions. For details, see Wake Smith's 2024 paper. And cooling the entire planet involves approximately 100 large, custom-made, high-altitude airplanes that inject material near the equator to block all climate tipping points. Reflecting sunlight at the scale needed and in the time frame needed is not easy to do. It involves risks. Two that stand out are site security risk and undercapitalization risk. Site security risk involves protecting reflectivity operations from physical attack. This is important since, in theory, any grumpy national leader could key the coordinates of reflectivity infrastructure into a missile guidance system and press a button. There are multiple reasons why they might do this, one of which is they perceive it as harmful. This is a complex topic since the magnitude of harm could vary in both time and place. And we would want to weigh it against the harm of doing nothing. Ultimately, this could get complicated and lead to fighting. Also, there's undercapitalization risk. This is when financial support for initial research is insufficient, followed by a panicked national leader that pushes forward at large scales before scientists had measured side effects at small scales. There are many potential problems, and these are just a few that stand out. To minimize risks, exhaustive field testing would be needed to evaluate different candidate materials in different locations with different monitoring instruments. Experiments such as these have not been conducted, even though changing the emission site of air pollution is of profound importance. For this reason, it is our intent to support sunlight reflectivity field experiments. For details, see video number nine. Okay, that's it for me, and I'll talk to you all real soon.